Live Better and Longer with The Fitness Show, hosted by fitness expert, author, and TV personality, Fitz Kohler. She'll tell you why diets are dumb, supplements are snake oil, and the truth about how you can earn a lean, hard, pain-free, and athletic body. Now for our favorite bossy blonde, Fitz Kohler. Hi team, I'm Fitz Kohler, your not so soggy race announcer from fitness.com and welcome to the fitness show. So I reference my lack of sogginess be because the last time I was with my guest, we were both drenched. That's right. We looked like we had been in the ocean next to the finish line at the Donna National Marathon to finish breast cancer. Uh, he ran the half marathon and one would think I did as well. And no, I just stood out there like a noisy bozo in the rain for hours on end. Uh, but we've got a great show. I'm really excited about this guy, this topic, and he's a urologist. And I feel foolish for not having a urologist on my show in the past because uh, all the people who are peeing and running, right? Peeing and running. So we're going to get on that. But if you're one of those people who may have peed while you ran or jumped or walked, this is going to be a super helpful show for you. And if you're someone who maybe wakes up all throughout the night to pee, or maybe you can't pee, or <laughs> pee is a big thing for everybody. No matter who you are, we're going to be talking about peeing. So our peeing is relevant to you. But uh, but this guy, so listen, when I saw him last, I thought he was going to die. And, and that's not a joke. I might have a little smile on my face right now because he's not dead. But this is a person who two weeks ago, I thought was about to die. So with that introduction, I am bringing in Dr. Clint Collins, a urologist from the Wakiver Clinic in Jacksonville. Welcome, Clint. Hi, McKeever. M McKeever. Mc like McIver, like MacGyver. It sounds like, it looks like you would say it Mac MacGyver, like MacGyver, but it's McKeever. McKeever. Did I forget it's, to say the Mick part? I just said Keever. Yeah, it's okay. I, th I thought you said I don't know. It's fine. It's okay. I it's didn't okay. I didn't I didn't make the name up. Okay, so listen, I've just said the word P about 70 times. It's you, yeah, you, I do that too a lot every day. We're gonna talk I say a it a lot. I say it a lot more than that. This is very exciting stuff. I think this is gonna be a great conversation. But before we get to all of the fascinating P questions, I want to talk to you about you because you were running you as you were finishing up the half marathon, folks, this is what I see. I see a gray man running towards me. He is absolutely colorless. Most most runners are kind of pink, kind of sweaty. They they have a different healthy glow to them. Uh, Dr. Collins here came at me with, it looked like there was zero blood left in his body. Like perhaps he had already been dead for several miles. And he was running with scooping arms, fists up, which is kind of unusual and a slack jaw you look like you were in a terrible shape. And as you came through that finish line, that's my my opportunity to get serious and say, medics, I need you now. And so between my, another runner and myself, we steered you off in the corner. So tell us about your race. What was going on? Ooh, yeah, so. Oh, um, and, and before you get there, tell me why you chose to run the Donna. Well, I, I live in Atlantic Beach and it actually goes by my house. I live. Um, like almost at 12th. Um, so it goes by my house. So last year I actually ran it for the first time sort of on a whim. I had been doing some other, uh, I guess, fitness work and I was getting into running and I didn't know about Galloway runners, but I saw these people go by with the pacer thing. And I was like, maybe I could just follow these people and if I and fall back if I can't make it. And so I ran it last year. And then this year I actually trained for it. Um, go figure I actually looked better crossing the finish line last year than I did this year. But um, this year I had a goal pace and I was a little probably pushing myself a little bit for that pace. I was trying to finish in two hours and I was on pace to do that um, until a, until I bonked. And uh, so I as far as the race went, I can you know, there's tons of details, but um, didn't feel great all day. I think I got there too late. I mean, it was I was all over the place, but um, I was on pace uh, to, I needed to finish the last three miles in 10 minutes uh, to make the two hour pace. So that was actually, you know, slower than race pace for two hour half. And, um, but I was, Wait, you know, so kind of, 
two you had to finish the last three I, miles in 10 minutes flat no, or 10, 10 minutes, minutes each yeah i had okay. 10 minutes per mile sorry okay. i had 10 minutes per mile to finish the last three miles and i would have been like maybe under a little bit under two hours but as those the last three miles were happening they, it was becoming a little bit more sketchy like i finished one in like nine and a half minutes and i was like ooh, that's that i thought that was race pace and so looking back i can i can think I mean, it's just so weird, you know, when you look back and you you remember what was going through your head. Yeah. And I think I was starting to fade and I was starting to make bad decisions around that time. And I was like, I was doing things like not drinking because you know how you sometimes feel heavy in your belly when yeah. you drink water. And so that you have that, but I was carrying water. I was carrying a hydration pack, still carrying it. But in my brain, I was like, don't drink more because, you know, you're going to be sloshing around. And, um, Actually, throughout the race, I think I limited my water a little bit because, um, again, peeing, um, I actually do have an overactive bladder, uh, which is exciting. Um, and so I, that morning, I got to the race and I had gone to the bathroom right before I left the house and I don't live very far away, got there and right, I had to go to the bathroom again and I had actually a full bladder. And so I was kind of stressed out throughout the race about having to pee again. And so I was, I think, limiting my fluid intake more than I normally would have. I did drink, but I don't think I drank as much as I needed. And uh, long story is uh, I started getting a little sketchy around mile 10 or 11. And um, by, I guess I had about a mile and a half to go. I was struggling, tired. And I was like, this vest is weighing me down. And I got to get, this is go time. And I, I like threw this, I take this Nathan vest that has, I've got all stuff in else and I just threw it at the side of the thing. I was like, I probably won't get this back, but I just, I'm going to go. And and for well, folks who don't know that Nathan vest is probably about $75, right? Yeah. Not a yeah, cheap I mean, yeah. I mean, but I didn't care at that time. I, I think in my brain, I remembered it. I was like, this is only 40 or $50, but <laughs> I'm replacing it now. And it's like, a, it's uh, more expensive, but, um, and my phone was in it. Oh boy. And I, I realized like 10 yards later, while every yard is like a struggle for me, that my phone was on the ground. So I go back, pick this vest up. I'm trying to get my phone out and my phone has, the case has broken. It's a little, it's got a little jagged edge. So it's stuck in the vest. I'm like fighting to get this thing out of the vest, finally get it out, throw the vest down. And now I'm like running like this. And um, so that was about a mile and a half um, by three quarters of a mile to go. I was like, okay, something isn't right here. And then with a, no, sorry, about half a mile to go, I was like, something isn't right. Like I started feeling a little dizzy. And then um, with a third of a mile, I remember um, I, my lips were tingling and I was, I mean, I was full blown, like, like, I mean, people were telling me to stop running. People were coming up and telling me that I need to sit down. And um, a few people I know asked if I needed help or if I wanted them to run with me. Um, all that kind of stuff. And I was like, no, you know, just I'm going to finish. And I couldn't, I could not, um, I could not run. Um, so I would, um, I was, I didn't want to just walk, but I would walk. And then I was like, let me try and speed up whatever I'm doing. And it was like, all I could do was to just do this like kind of shuffle that yeah. was maybe, you know, a tenth of a mile an hour faster than a walk. And that's what I did. And I just remember gasping like I was I mean, I can I can hear it. And you've got there are so many pictures of me because it took me so long to finish that last half of a mile. Uh, it took me like eight minutes to go the last third of a mile from what I can gather on as far as like where I was in the race. I think it took me eight minutes. So there are tons of pictures of me and there are pictures of me going. And that's me gasping for air. It's not me just I mean, I was literally like, yeah, I had no. I could not breathe. And that was just me just going like this. But I was like, you know, I worked this hard for this race and this pace. I'm going to get across the finish line as fast as I can. And I'm definitely not quitting. And, um, and that's when you saw me, I knew I looked horrible. I mean, I, I knew I looked like a hot mess, but I was like, you know, I'm just wanting to finish, you know? And then I was like, and people were wanting to help me. And I was like, yes, I will let you help me now. You know, thank you. Yeah. But I, I, um, I just was like, I can see the finish line. I know I can get across the finish line. Then we'll figure the rest out. I did not know what I looked like. And I looked bad. I mean, I knew I looked bad, but I did not know I looked that bad. Um, 
Yeah. yeah, you and 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 this is no. I think I was about to pass out. I think I was about to pass out. I I, I certainly thought you were about to go into cardiac arrest. Right. And, and yeah, so that's, I know. that's a little bit of a theme for us lately. We've seen a bunch of that, and yeah. I actually just had some guests on the show who two of them dropped dead at the Monterey Bay Half Marathon. Thankfully, a cardiologist happened to be running behind both of them. And, uh, yeah. 10 seconds after they they died, he was there to revive them. But that's what I thought was happening yeah. and, with you. And look, I, I don't know exactly. I, from what I, I mean, I was, I sat down in the wheelchair with those, with the medics and they had, they, I mean, because I remember last you said, what did they give you IV fluids? I was just in a wheelchair with like five medics slash cops around. They look like cops to me, but, but anyway, they were, uh, and they, they gave me a bottle of water and they were asking me all these questions, checking my blood sugar, checking my blood pressure on one of those finger things, which I, I've not seen those before, huh. but, um, my blood pressure was actually running high. So I don't know how accurate that was, but, um, cause my blood pressure is usually pretty low to start with, but, um, regardless, it wasn't low, it was higher. Um, and, but I remember like the guy was asking me questions and I could barely keep my eyes open. I, I was like, about to, I just felt like I was going to fall asleep. Um, and you know, 10 minutes went by, they, um, this isn't, this is like, do as I say, not as I do, but, um, cause I, I fully admit that I did not do what is the right thing to do. Um, I signed against medical advice to not go to the hospital, um, because I felt like I was I felt better. And I mean, I did, I felt better within five minutes. And then within 10 minutes, I was up and walking away from there. And, um, but yeah, I signed against medical advice, which, you know, there's, there's all things we can say about that. Um, but you know, I felt dramatically better and you saw pictures, I think of, like my color was back sure. then as well, but yeah. Um, so I Dr. Would, Collins, mm -hmm. this is what I want to ask is, what do you think was going on with you? Why were you gray? Do you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that my body was preserving blood flow to vital organs and it was taking it away from things like my hands and my face because the skin and my face, like it, you don't need that to, to, to survive. And, um, I think, I mean, you can see it. I mean, like it was the most pronounced at my mouth and then it kind of went out here and then you can see my hands were white, white, and I didn't have anything over them. And, um, and of course, you know, I was getting dizzy. I mean, my blood pressure had to have been dropping. Um, I don't, I just, I don't think that thing that they checked it with was accurate. I think my blood pressure was in the toilet and I think I probably, I mean, I wouldn't have been able to finish the race. And I don't think even I, as stubborn as I am, would have tried if I would have been even like two miles from the finish line. I don't think I probably could have finished. Right. But I was, I mean, I was a third of a mile from the line and I was like, I can get there. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't, it, the one thing that bothers me is to, I don't like the idea of, you know, people thinking or it possibly having been a risk that I could have been the guy that dropped dead at the, at the race. I mean, I don't want to be that guy that's putting myself right. at that kind of risk. And I did not think I was doing that at the time. <laughs> But yeah. um, I mean, so, maybe I was. I hate to say that. It's just it's scary. Yeah. So I think you were. And for those who are listening only and not watching, Dr. Collins is a fit guy. So he's not he's not older. He's not overweight. He's got none of those risk factors you might co connect with someone who looks like they might be dying at the end of half marathon. You were prepared. Um, but I do think you are exhibit A of uh, people checking their ego. You know, this mm -hmm. refusal yeah. to pause really yeah. can do a lot more harm than good, not only for someone in your position who's just, you know, your actual system is bonking. Uh, and, and you know, let's say you didn't have a heart attack, but you 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 gave out and you split your head open or lost your teeth. Mm -hmm. There were there was a bunch yeah. of things you were. Yeah, I could have before. definitely lost consciousness. I mean, I, I absolutely could have lost consciousness. One thousand percent. And that was you know, but then you take into consideration that maybe I was dehydrated already. And then my, my, you know, I didn't have a lot of reserve in my bloodstream to, to bring my blood pressure back up. And you're taking for granted, like that passing out when you're at that situation is a lot different than pass, just passing out. Like you, you, pa you know, you're passing out at that stage because you've lost blood pressure. You've lost, you know, perfusion in, 
and you're not going to come back as well as you would if you were, you know, just kind of got dizzy and passed out at your house or something. Um, so that is scary. I mean, look, I'll, I'll own it. Um, I mean, I'll, I also, you know, and we'll, we should, it's hard, you know, as these, as endurance athletes, as, as athletes, um, which I wouldn't have called myself two years ago. Um, but as endurance athletes, you know, we, we work to push ourselves, right? I mean, you, you push yourselves and it's, it is, it can be hard to draw the line of like, when, when, it, when do you keep pushing and when do you say, okay, this is enough. And I mean, I, I'll admit it's hard. It's, I have a hard, I apparently don't, I'm, I'm one of those people that don't know when. <laughs> well, well, hopefully this was a lesson that, you know, yeah. if you were in cer future circumstances, you might remember the words you're saying right now. So yeah. if, if you could do over, what are five things you would do differently on race day? Okay. Um, so for me, I actually let a very close friend who is wonderful and I do not blame him at all, but he had a different race plan and he offered to drive me to the race and he was a lot more laid back about timing. And I uh, got there later than I would have normally gotten there. Okay. And I didn't have my bib on. And I mean, like I was just a mess to start with. And so there were, you know, I got to the race late. Um, I think I carried too much water on my back and didn't drink it. Okay. Um, so I think I had a, my pack was too heavy, but again, I think I, I was grasping that right before the race, but I had no time to make any changes to my vest, to what was in there. And I just think all that kind of stuff was like spinning through my head from the very beginning of the race. Um, I would have now, again, I'm still, I'm still learning a lot. I mean, I'm still very much in the learning phase of this whole running and exercise, you know, yeah, it's, uh, it's races. complicated. You're not, yeah. you're not alone. It's very, very tricky. I ran Boston marathon a, a few years ago and I had a game plan for hydration yeah. and right. peeing and not peeing and all that stuff. So that you're not alone in that that well and i so i had been practicing yeah you're you're asking me what so let, let me let me stay on tap on, yeah. on point i'm sorry i'm very tangential but um i would uh i would have you know tr had some time to kind of adjust there um i think maybe i should have dealt more with or um uh, replenished or, or loaded electrolytes a little bit better the day or two before the day before i didn't really that was not part of my plan and that's kind of like a, i didn't get that memo maybe as much. I had my salt uh, stick things that I was doing during the race. And that was my electrolyte plan, I guess. Um, and maybe that's enough, but maybe it wasn't. I don't know. Um, I, what else? Um, I wouldn't have put so much pressure on myself for the pace. Um, but again, it's, that's where I'm drawing the line where it's like, I, I told myself, and I still am proud of my time. I mean, but, and I told myself if I didn't get that pace, it was going to be okay. But it's like, you either try for it or you don't kind of thing. And that, I just had that as sort of my keep working right. kind of thing. You know how it goes like throughout the race, you can choose to be a go a little bit, make it a little bit easier and suddenly six minutes are gone. And so I was just trying to use that as kind of a, you know, a th whatever, a benchmark, but I definitely was so stressed out about that timing that I was like, I can't go to the bathroom during the race. And so I was, I was limiting my fluids. I mean, I 1000% limited my fluid intake during the race. Now I, I did drink, I mean, don't nuts, but I didn't drink what I normally would have. And, um, like I almost didn't drink any water. So I have, I have some B, I, I have a BCAA with a tiny amount of pre-workout in a mix. And it's like in a thing about if you, it's probably a, Sure. Eight to 10 ounce thing. I had two of those and I didn't even finish both of those. So yeah. And, um, and to point out the Donna has hydration stations every yeah. mile. So it's certainly sure. not lacking on that course. Water no, absolutely. And Gatorade. My, my thing has always been, it stresses me out to stop and have to drink the, you know, like I feel right. like I'm like choking sure, on it. Sure. So I had been practicing with my vest and like how to do everything. And I drank less water during that mm -hmm. race than I have on training. And I haven't been training at race pace. I was, I was racing at race pace and that was the hardest half that I've ever run. So it was, I was, you know, I was using more energy. I was right. you know, going to be more dehydrated. And I let, I use, I mean, I just drank less fluid because in my brain, I was like, you know, I don't want to have to pee. And, <laughs> and then it's just crazy. And, and, and then, 
it, well, yes, and we and, and but it's common, so not yeah. not stupid is really, but and fascinating for a urologist, not yeah. thinking. <laughs> Oh, well, and not to get too personal, school. but like I said, yeah, I mean, I told you, I, I've got an overactive bladder. I'll, I'll say that out loud. I'm a urologist. I've gone to a urologist. Like I have a more over, I have an overactive bladder. And so it's, it's in my, and people that have overactive bladders, they will, they're more mindful of it. Yeah. And they do have more like anxiety about, you know, they know they don't have as much of a, a win, you know, as much of a reserve there as some people would. And so it's a fine line between, you know, feeling like you're hydrated and feeling like, oh my gosh, now I've got, I've got to go four times or something. So I probably is a little bit more anxious about that than your average person. Um, but I'm sure that there are some listeners that are going, oh, that's me. That's me. Cause I, I, I treat these people. This is my, I actually am a subspecialist in this. And so that's what I see all the time. Um, but yeah, so I wouldn't have limited my hydration. And, um, and then you wouldn't and, have reject, rejected a trip to the hospital, correct? Correct. Yes. I think when you you know, are literally passing out. And I knew I was, I knew I was very close to passing out. Yeah. Then, um, you know, you, you go to the hospital and you get IV fluids and you make sure that you get an EKG. I mean, you, you know, I'm 47, you know, I mean, not that a 25 year old can't have a heart attack, but I mean, unfortunately I'm in, the, I'm old now I'm older. I'm, you know, I'm getting there. These are, I'm in the age group where people, you know, You're are shocked. Not. Yeah, I'm a grown up. I'm shocked that they're shocked that the 47 year old guy died of a heart attack at a marathon. So, um, yeah, I would do that. And I would um, have let the people that were trying to help me, uh, you know, and, you know, who were multiple people stopping me going, you, I mean, they're looking at me like I'm insane, which I was, um, you know, you've got to stop. You need to stop running you know, that kind of thing. I would have been like, okay, maybe I should trust my fellow man. And, just yeah. sit down for a bit. Well, I'm I'm so happy you made it. And again, you were my scariest customer of the day. And I I it it shudders to make me think about all of the athletes who are in the same predicament that you are that are just really trying to get there and trying maybe to preserve mm -hmm. their time and maybe limiting nutrition or hydration. And you know, they don't make it to me. They they bonk somewhere in a big awful way somewhere along the course. And so lesson learned folks is listen to your body, ego. It's it, before we're athletes, we're people. Your health actually comes before your time, before your finish time, before your athletic accomplishment. This is all about health. And if you, if you push it too hard, then you sacrifice your actual health. So yeah, um, thank you for sharing that story because I, I thought it was fascinating. I'm glad we connected online. I love seeing, oh, look, he's got rosy cheeks. And then when you said I'm a doctor, I thought, oh my gosh, <laughs> this can't be true. Yeah. But yeah, I, yeah, yeah. We, I, 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 want, I want you to start by talking about overactive bladder and that that's both a, a guy and a gal issue and what causes that and and how do you see people how do you see it affecting people especially in fitness sure so i mean it's a syndrome from you know by definition of the aua etc but just in lay people talking I think when you're talking about overactive bladder you're talking about you know going to the bathroom frequently and um there are a lot of reasons for that um you know there are so many reasons but um, you know, some people drink too much and, and, or drink maybe not necessarily too much, but they drink enough that they are filling their bladder frequently and their bladder is telling them they need to empty it frequently. And that's appropriate. So that's not an overactive bladder. That's just urinary frequency. Um, but, a, like a, an average bladder holds about 10 to 15 ounces when it's full. So 300 to 500 cc's is pretty average for a full bladder. Um, so if you, you know, if you're urinating every hour to two hours and you're only getting five ounces out, well, that's more of an overactive bladder or, you know, inappropriate sensation of fullness. Um, and your bladder's telling you you need to go when you really shouldn't have to. So um, that's more of the overactivity kind of thing. And, um, you know, there's a number of reasons for that. Um, you know, so let's not leave out the men. So, you know, men, we hear about prostate, you know, enlarged prostates, all that kind of stuff. So, you know, if a male, if their bladder is obstructed by their prostate, which is the more common reason to for men to have issues, um, it will physically change over time and it becomes overactive. Um, you know, so that's that's a real common reason for men to have to go frequently. But diabetes is is absolutely a very common culprit. Um, so 
diabetics will most commonly have overactive bladders, but sometimes they'll have underactive bladders. Hmm. Um, and that's another funny thing where the bladder actually tells you. So what a lot of people with underactive bladders will, um, will come to me, they'll complain of uh, leaking because they're, they're so underactive that they're spilling urine over the, wow. you know, it's thinking like spilling over a dam. Uh-huh. So the, 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 the underactive bladders will spill water over the dam because their bladder is really not ever empty. And they're anyway, that's, that's, yeah. And that's, that's kind of rare. That's, that's, that's more uncommon, but mo- more commonly diabetics will have overactive bladders, urinary frequency, urgency, having to rush to the bathroom, can't make it there. That's urge incontinence. Um, people with back injuries. So any kind of neurologic uh, deficit, you know, some kind of, you know, if you've had, uh, if you have a pinched nerve or a herniated disc, if you've had, even if you've had back surgery to fix it, a lot of times patients will end up with, with changes, uh, definitely in that the lumbosacral area where the, the bladder nerves are, um, you'll see a lot of, you know, changes, but overactivity, very frequent. I mean, very common um, stroke patients. So anybody that's had a traumatic brain injury or, um, or a stroke, anything up here, you know, above the brainstem will very commonly uh, later have overactive bladder. And then can people bring that on themselves with nutrition? Are there irritants? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, artificial sweeteners, caffeine, you know, those are two of the big, big culprits. Some people have sensitive bladders or they may even have a condition called interstitial cystitis. That's a, the that's another kind of syndrome, but the bladder doesn't like um, things that penetrate the, bl- it, it doesn't like acidity and doesn't like, um, doesn't, uh, bladders that interstitial cystitis bladders do not uh, accept acidic urine very well. I'm not really making much sense there, but, okay. and so anything that you, that adds acidity to the urine. So even like healthy things like citric acid, citrus fruits, um, citr- uh, you know, juices, um, uh, but yeah, artificial sweeteners and spices. So some people will find that their their bladder is more overactive with that kind of thing. But some people just have overactive bladders. It's just it, there's a syndrome out, and we there's some basic science you know studies out there to to study to figure out why this happens. But it's very common in el- the more the older we get, the more common. It's more common in women, um, and you know, women between fifty and eighty. I mean, it's probably more common than not that many are going to have an overactive bladder. So how many, how many times uh, going, how many times if you urinate per day, what is considered overactive bladder? Is there a number? So, um, well, there is, but I don't like to use numbers as much because I, like I was defining earlier, you know, like what is your bladder capacity? Right. So, you know, what we'll sometimes do is do a, I mean, it's a little nerdy, but we'll ask patients to do a voiding diary. And so they'll collect their urine in something. And every time they go, they actually measure how much comes out. Okay. So, but you, I mean, you should be able to, I mean, every bit of two, you should two to three hours, you know, you should be able to postpone urination that long. But, you know, if you're guzzling water, like everybody's like everybody jokes about these mm-hmm. big Stanley things now, and, you know, especially runners and, uh, you know, athletes, they're trying to be healthy and they're drinking all this water. I mean, you're, you may go every 30 minutes. Um, absolutely. If, if you're filling your bladder that often, um, but go, sorry, so, go ahead. no, so that's, I mean, obviously that's an issue for endurance runner. If you're a sprinter, mm-hmm. fine, no big whoop, but if you're going to be running, you know, 10, 13, 26 and more miles having to go every yeah. 30 minutes is a real problem. So, um, so I, I think you have to balance it. I think you balance what you you need, you know, because your black, your, your body is not going to, you're trying to replace right as well. I mean, that's, that's what we're mainly trying to do is replace the fluids and then um, not get behind. So I think that's where training comes in, you know, and, and figuring out what your body does, like what does your body do with training and with on a, you know, on a hot day or a day where it's not as hot and you're maybe not sweating as much. Um, And that's, I mean, I think you almost have to train yourself to figure out what, what you can, what is normal for you and what isn't. So when I ran Boston, it was a big concern for me because I thought, oh my gosh, and I run so slow. So I thought I'm going to be out there forever. I don't want to have to keep stopping to use the loo. My big strategy was to cut out caffeine completely for about a week before Boston. And even though, um, well, even though I finished the race, it wasn't very fast, but I finished it. But I was so proud at the end. I was almost equally proud 
of not having to pee once during the Boston Marathon. Yeah. That was one of my greatest accomplishments yeah. that I thought, okay, I managed, I did, I hydrated perfectly, but I- And you didn't bonk. So that's the thing. Like I didn't have to pee either, but I wasn't <laughs> making urine, I don't think. You know, like, I, I mean, so that's where it is. I mean, like, I'll admit it's even as a urologist, I don't know the absolute answer for how much your how much fluids you need. But what I would say is, you know, you need to, you know, go with what you practice. I drank less on race day than I drink during a training run. Yeah, because we've done I've done, you know, 14 mile training runs. And I drank less on race day than I did. I just went to that place. And, and I think because, again, not to get too much back to what I did, but, you know, they say how um, you'll start making bad decisions when you start to bonk. Yeah. And I remember too. looking back at with three, probably about three miles to go is when I was starting to make bad decisions. I mean, I made some bad decisions earlier too, by not right. drinking as much, but I was starting to really kind of do that more. Um, but yeah, so I think that's where, and you, and you go, you know, on race day, you, you do what you've done. You know, you don't, you don't limit your fluids because you, it's race day. Yeah. So stupid. Right. It is. So, so if somebody wants to <clears throat> do kind of like me, run their marathon and not have to stop and use the restroom at all, do you think cutting out caffeine and those artificial artificial sweeteners or the spicy foods for a few days in advance, do you think that could be part of the strategy? I'm trying to think what can Absolutely. people actually do to yeah. help themselves through this? So, I mean, and again, everybody's different. So some people don't have this problem, but like, right. I think people but that are more- do, more aware, yeah. If you're more of a, oh gosh, what am I, you know, how am I going to get through this? Then you are probably somebody with one, you know, a bladder that doesn't like all those artificial sweeteners and is more sensitive to caffeine because it caffeine is a bladder irritant. It's a bladder st stimulant and it is a diuretic. So, um, you know, along with all the other things it does. So, you know, we like our caffeine, but, um, you know, if you feel like when you drink your pre-workout or you drink your coffee or whatever, you feel that just burning kind of down in your bladder and you find yourself, you know, going to the bathroom more frequently uh, after your cups of coffee, um, then you're probably the one that, yeah, needs to back off that around race time. Um, again, yeah, all the spicy stuff can, you know, kind of pay attention to how that kind of stuff uh, treats you normally. And if you find that you're more sensitive, you know, when you drink that, you're going to want to like back off on that. I mean, I'm again, I'm another person that should have listened to that. I probably yeah. didn't need, you know, all that stuff in my on in my bottle on race day. Well, it's fascinating because we talk a lot about nutrition and how are we going to manage our our caloric intake, which is also very important, but nobody's talking about the pee issue. And I think yeah. the pee issue is a big deal to endurance athletes, whether you're cycling or swimming or whatever. It's probably easier if you're swimming, I'm guessing. <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah, watching what you put in your mouth, stop pissing off your bladder. Um, yeah. That's a very funny, yeah, stop pissing off your well, bladder. Um, nutrition. Sorry, I'm interrupting. That's yeah, absolutely. Um, and, but also I think people take for, take, I mean, they take their bladder for granted, you know, I mean, people don't, I, I can't tell you how many people come to me with problems that they, they just don't feel like, they don't really have any insight as to what they are doing to their bladder. So I think sometimes it just takes a professional to, to kind of see the big picture and to tell you, Hey, this is actually maybe what's going on. And they're like, Oh, wow. I had no idea. And so, you know, if you are suffering from this, you, you just go see, you know, maybe go see a urologist, see a, you know, someone who's specialized in avoiding dysfunction, because for then another, you know, uh, opportunity to, you know, reach our listeners is overactive bladder, unfortunately, can mean other things, you know, you can have things in your bladder that aren't supposed to be there, that are causing overactivity. So don't, I don't want everybody to think they have bladder cancer, but you could have bladder cancer, you know, so if you're having irritated bladder symptoms that are, you know, had that are controlling your life or affecting your life significantly, you, you may, you need to see someone and we need to kind of rule the bad stuff out. Then we can work about your, work, work on your symptoms. But, um, but yeah, I mean, absolutely the, the diet stuff, but don't, don't just go holistic on it and not think that maybe there's something that someone might need to, you know, look, you know, we, we scope um, bladders and we see bladder tumors. Yeah. And I've, I've seen, I've seen patients that, 
you know, they were wetting their, themselves on the way to the bathroom for years, or they were seeing a little bit of blood in their urine here and there. And, you know, that's a, that's a trip to a urologist. You need to see a urologist for that stuff. That's an excellent, absolutely an excellent point. Now, um, before we get off of overactive bladder, is there a medicine for that? Is there any sort of actual treatment? Yes, absolutely. So um, there's some great medications. Uh, Historically, there was one class of medications and they just kind of like changed up the receptors a little bit, but they all had the same bothersome side effects of constipation, dry mouth, and sometimes confusion. Those are anticholinergic. So a lot of the older medications and some of you listeners, if you're, you know, if you're over 40 or 50 and you've taken a medication, you very possibly have used those. And if you didn't like those or they didn't work for you, or you had side effects, there is another class of medications that's been out for, it's been out for a while, about, you know, maybe 15 or 20 years, but um, even, you know, a lot of people haven't been offered those yet. Um, There's a a newer uh, drug in that same class that many even urologists don't even prescribe yet um, because it's only been sort of, you know, I guess out uh, FDA approved for a number of years. And so they're, they're not, they're not prescribing. So they, you know, a lot of patients haven't been offered that. And those two drugs um, that are in that class, I'm not going to name them because we're not, you know, uh, right. Uh, But they, uh, the side effect profile is great. I mean, they, people tolerate it really well and it's, it can help a lot. Okay. That's, that's good to know. That's uh, it's very interesting. And I, and I encourage everybody much like you is go see a urologist. It's one of those, um, I don't know, I guess it's one of those uncomfortable body parts people like to avoid. They don't want to talk about, they certainly don't want anyone poking and prodding around in their nether regions, but it's quality of life and actual health. I mean, there could be real risks involved if you're having problems. Yeah. And I can, uh, I mean, I just say this, that I know it's easy for me to say on my end of it, but, you know, this is what we do for a living and you really don't need to feel nervous about seeing any of us because this is, this is just, this is what we do. And we are very good at making you feel comfortable talking about this kind of stuff because this is what you're, we expect you to, to come to talk to us about. Um, So it's, it's totally normal. Don't get nervous. Don't be embarrassed because this is, I mean, it's just, you know, it's, it's the normal thing for us. It's the things I, the questions I ask patients um, every day kind of make people laugh, but that's, that's normal to me. So I'm going to move on to another topic. Sure. So I've been teaching fitness since I was 15, just turned 15. And ever since I was 15, women have been telling me that when they run, they pee or when they jump, they pee or yeah. any, they're, they're pee, pee, pee all the time. And, uh, that, that can't be fun. That can't be fun at all. So tell us why does that happen and uh, what can we do yeah. about it? So you're probably referring to what's called what we were, what we uh, have termed uh, stress urinary incontinence. So whenever you're, you are increasing the intra-abdominal pressure that is then transmitted to your bladder um, and your outlet resistance. So what you use to hold that in is overcome by that extra pressure that is called stress urinary incontinence. You're stressing that outlet resistance and your outlet resistance is losing. And so you're wet, you know, you're squirting a little urine here and there, you know, dribbling a little urine here and there. Um, that is, that's, so the way that we fix that, um, and the, or well, let's start with why you have that. Um, it is much more common in women, um, m- more common in women who have born children. Um, definitely even more common in women who have had the that child has entered the birth canal because there's even more trauma to the pelvic floor there but even just you know carrying a child for nine months isn't going to do anything good for the pelvic floor <laughs> um so and there are there are just there are there is a lot of connective tissue um ligaments and um connective tissue that that give you your continence your urinary continence and that all um, goes south, honestly. I mean, goes you know, goes south with age and with with those um, you know with with childbearing and that sort of thing. So, just specifically, like your urethra has a pubocervical lig- ligament. So if your bladder's up here and you're draining out here, whenever you cough, this ligament that's attached to your pubic bone, it's it's sta- it stays it's there, and your urethra is caught with this sort of like this hammock whenever you cough. And so it catches that and it holds your urine in. That's one of the mechanisms. Well, a lot of women have lost that with 
you know, these changes. And so that's where, you know, we can go and do sling. We can play slings, which is kind of like a putting another hammock in there. Okay. Um, there are there are agents that we can inject into the um, under the mucosa of the urethra to bulk them up. That's they're very effective. Just it's like a hydrogel, super effective. I use that all the time. And then there's there is pelvic floor physical therapy, which we do recommend. Um, but one thing that I do want to also stress is that there are physical therapists that are that are subspecialty or they're special, they are specialized in the pelvic floor. And I would urge you to go to one of those physical therapists if you are having these problems, because what a lot of patients will say is, oh, well, I do my Kegels, I do my exercises. But if you're already having those problems, you're actually probably poorly coordinated in those muscles and those areas that you really need to strengthen. And so many patients are actually activating the wrong muscles. So all these quote unquote, you know, Kegels or whatever they're calling them, they're not even really doing the exercises correctly. And so um, the pelvic floor therapist can help teach them to engage the correct muscles. They can clarify and confirm that they are engaging those muscles correctly. And they are, you know, very good at, you know, at least getting as much out of that as, as you can. Um, I, and so I think a lot of people throw, you know, I looked at a video and I've been doing those exercises. If you're leaking and you're having a lot of trouble with your pelvic floor, you know, see a urologist, see a urogynecologist, get to a pelvic floor therapist. Just, you know, don't just sit there at home and say you've done it and it didn't work. And so now I got to suffer. Uh, fantastic advice. So today I posted in a couple of running groups and I said, I'm bringing the urologist on my show. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, can you, and if you do, you can private message me them. And one woman's her question is, uh, will I have to wear diapers for the rest of my life as I run? And um, she said it, it, she doesn't leak when she runs slow, but when she runs fast and it sounds like she is a fast mm -hmm. runner, she yeah. leaks. So, so what you're saying is there are solutions. No, what, you, per what percentage? Stop of suffering. <laughs> like these, like the women are like, so I don't, you know, they, they'll just suffer and suffer. And mm -hmm. there are so many women that just have relegated themselves to wearing diapers and pads and this and that. They just think it's normal. I mean, I, I have patients that come to me and they, it's almost difficult for me sometimes to get them to let me help them because they've been brainwashed into thinking that this is something that is normal with, for women to, you know, and it's not, it's, it's, it's not uncommon as women age and have had children, but it's not normal. And it's not, you don't have to accept it. There are, Yes, there are patients that fail therapy and there, unfortunately, there are patients that have had things done and, you know, yes, there are sometimes complications with treatment, but m most patients, we can, we can drastically improve their continence and we can, our goal would be to completely cure the issue. But as someone who's not had anything done absolutely could be dry. I mean, they, the goal is for them to be dry and we have plenty of options. And again, like I said, that that urethral bulking agent that's that's somewhat new has been a game changer. It's it's not a it's not a you know one side. It, it might not be the right thing for everyone, but it has been a really good option for many, and it's very effective. And it's it's like a literally like an outpatient procedure, and there's almost no recovery. Like you can go exercise. I, I usually tell people just wait a couple of days, but you're there's like no recovery. Um, so, and even a sling, like if you happen to have a sling, that's, you know, there's a little recovery there, but it's still a tiny little vaginal incision, not a ton of pain, you know, that kind of thing. So, so for the great majority of people who are incontinent, there is hope. There is hope. Absolutely. Absolutely. Don't, don't, no, you don't have to wear diapers for the rest of your life. Um, I mean, there are some people that, um, that have some unfortunate conditions and they're more challenging to manage, but you know, that's, that's not typical and you're, you know, you're, your typical woman that's out there running marathons is going to be the one that we can help a lot. I love that. That's exciting news. I hope all of my listeners, if you're getting very exciting to hear about this, you're sharing it with your girlfriends, share it with all the people that you think may want to hear that. Um, I, I, I'm very fortunate. It's never been an issue for me, but I've had hundreds of women over mm -hmm. the course of my career uh, tell me that it was, and I, my heart just breaks for them. What a pain in the, yeah. Hoo-ha issue yeah. to deal with. And to know that it's it's resolvable is really exciting. So what issues do men typically have with their 
uh, their with their bladder and their urethra e urethra mm -hmm. and exercise? What are what are guy problems? So I was I kind of was thinking about that as I was you know preparing here. I didn't um, so. I, like I said, men, um, sh the stress incontinence is much less common in men. So a man that's had his prostate removed or for prostate cancer or who has um, had a transurethral resection of his prostate or some sort of transurethral surgery for enlarged prostate might have, oh, excuse me, <laughs> uh, might have more, uh, you know, they're going to have definitely, if you've had your prostate removed for prostate cancer, you're going to have that's probably going to be the the highest risk of stress incontinence in men. Um, and then after that, you know, still m small risk, but someone who's had trained urethral surgery for the prostate may have a little bit of leakage. Um, that is not expected, by the way. We do not expect to have that, but that's, that's you know, it's a possibility. Um, but most men don't leak when they cough, sneeze, that sort of thing. Um, I would say that more men uh, have trouble emptying their, you know, their, the, what's more common for men is to have trouble emptying their bladder because of the prostate. So if you think about, you know, you start with a bladder that's, I'm using my hands, I know some of this is audio, but, um, you know, you got 300 cc's, okay, you got 10 ounces of, of, of space there to, to work with. Well, if that man only empties down to where he's still only, if when he goes to the bathroom, he still has 200 cc's left, or, you know, is that six, six he's and only a half ounces? A third. Yeah, yeah, th yeah, third of his bladder. You it doesn't matter how black, how large your bladder is. You've basically effectively only got that third of the bladder capacity. So it's like taking someone who had a 10 ounce bladder and giving them a three ounce bladder okay. or a three and a half ounce bladder. So that would be a more common issue that men have to deal with. And so their frequency uh, may be because of that. Now, um, can uh, do all men's prostates grow over time? Is that a natural occurrence or is that something that can be slowed or prevented with healthy habits? Yeah. So it, there's not, I, I mean, we recommend a, a healthy diet, that sort of thing. And, um, but there enlarged prostate is more of a genetic condition. There's really nothing, not much that you're going to do. Um, to, I mean, soy, like a lot of soy is maybe can increase your like some things, but essentially you're not going to do anything that's going to make your prostate grow. And there's not much that you're going to do to keep it from growing if you're genetically predisposed to that. Um, but we have medications and we have treatments for that. Um, so you just kind of need to pay attention to your body and your weak stream and you're getting up all night long and, you know, going to the bathroom frequently and urgently. That is a sign of something, you know, and it's more commonly prostate for men, but sometimes it's not. Some men just have overactive bladders as well. Okay. Um, and again, let's not forget the bad stuff like cancers and things like that. So, um, but yeah, the more commonly for men, they're going to not empty their bladder or feel like they have to spend forever trying to go the weak stream and the slow stream. And so I'm, I'm sitting at the toilet or I'm sitting at the urinal and it's taken me two minutes to empty my bladder. And it's because they're, they're obstructed, you know, at their, they're going through a, a tight little uh, funnel there. Okay. So uh, probably the same message for the guys is don't sit home and just accept defeat. Go talk to a urologist, especially if, if you're not sleeping very well, because you're up all night peeing, you're probably not going to be exercising. You're probably going to have yeah, most of your habits go downhill because of lack of sleep. So this is important quality of life stuff. And as you said, it could be something that's um, minimally scary up front versus super scary if you wait too long to find out what's going on, right? And yeah, and let's not forget prostate cancer. I mean, I I I, I like to some extent that men kind of get scared that they have prostate cancer whenever they start having these symptoms because it gets them in for screening. But those symptoms are usually related to benign enlargement, like non-cancerous mm -hmm. enlargement. But um, it doesn't change the fact that men should, you know, definitely within between the ages of 50 and 70 should be uh, should be 55 and 70 should be screened for prostate cancer. But, you know, that's a AUA guideline. Um, if you have a family history of prostate cancer, if you're African-American screening, you want to screen earlier. Um, you know, if you're a guy that, you know, life expectancy is maybe going to be longer than the average male because you're so healthy, you know, maybe you screen a little bit longer, but, you know, get your screening that, that can be done through a primary doctor, but, um, doesn't, you know, if you have all these symptoms, 
and you're not getting screened or you you have these symptoms, get yourself to a urologist and let us kind of tease out the nuances. So recently I had Dr. Stephen Loam, a cardiologist on my show. He's the physician who saved two runners who dropped dead of cardiac arrest at the Monterey Bay Half Marathon, resuscitated both of them, and they, they went on to run that race the next year, which was magnificent. But Dr. Loam is a huge proponent of plant-based diet, plant-based nutrition, and one of the things he was talking about is, you know, how saturated fats, animal products are the number one cause of heart disease and how so many of his heart patients come in, suffer also from erectile dysfunction. Yes. And when he convinces them to go plant-based, all of a sudden uh, their Mr. Happy is working the way it's <laughs> supposed to. So, yeah. uh, so what are your thoughts on nutrition and erectile dysfunction? Earlier, you asked me about the enlarged prostate, but they there have been some studies that, and, and probably one of the, I guess, better, some of the better data as far as like, what can we do to prevent prostate cancer? It's um, a heart healthy diet, low fat diet has, that is, we can at least say that. we That's a good idea anyway. I'm just saying from a prostate cancer and these, you know, from a urologic perspective, that is one of the things that we even propose. I mean, for cardiac health and general wellness, absolutely. But, um, but yes, erectile dys dysfunction, um, you know, the Euro AUA, and I mean, we've even made comments that or made statements that um, erectile dysfunction should be considered. You should have a cardiovascular assessment if you have erectile dysfunction, because it can be an early sign of cardiovascular disease. Uh, now, everybody who has erectile dysfunction doesn't have cardiovascular um, etiology for it, but many do. So, yes. Um, you know, diabetics, again, diabetics, um, erectile dysfunction is very, um, very common. It's a, you know, because you get neuropathies too, right, with diabetics. And there's a, that lots of nerves. Um, we've got neurovascular bundles that you know, supply the erections. And then, of course, diabetics also have damage to these small arteries and veins, and um, which is, a, you know, the, how we get erections. So decreasing your risk for diabetes by eating well and, you know, staying healthy um will will decrease that risk and then i mean I, I can't tell you how many men that lose you know a certain percentage of their body weight how how much better they feel um you know our hormone levels can change um with with weight gain and all that sort of thing as well so so absolutely i mean i i would not um i would not or i would not uh say that your, all of your erectile dysfunction is going to be cured by, you know, skipping the burger. But in general, your overall well-being is affecting your erectile function. Absolutely. Um, you know, if you're, you know, I'll have patients come to me in very poor health and their main complaint is erectile dysfunction. I'm like, come on, man, like your hemoglobin A1C is like through the roof, you know, which means their blood sugar has been, you know, through the roof for the last three months. So, you know, we've got to, we've, yes, it's, it's, uh, we are fortunate in that we can, uh, we can uh, influence men's health sometimes um, by saying, look, if, if you don't get this fixed, your erectile function's not going to get any better. But it's, it is sad that it takes that because we should all want to be healthier, um, regardless of our function, right? Well, you're totally right. But I, completely value a physician who will look a patient dead in the eye and tell them the truth. I mean, I think it's so impactful yeah. when someone who, you know, maybe they look at me and they're like, ah, she's just a fitness girl. What does she know? But then when a doctor says, you're not going to make it to 70, if you don't change the way you're eating, if you don't cut out your cigarettes and stop your drinking, you won't get another five years, buddy, or, or your wiener's not going to work or what, you know, yeah. whatever it is. I think it's, you have a profound ability to change people for the better with clarity and not beating around the bush. Yeah, there's a balance. I mean, I think I've, I've had some patients come to me who got turned off by the, the delivery of yeah. some people. And I, I've had some people that didn't like my delivery because I, I can't, I mean, my family thinks I'm the most blunt person that ever existed. Whereas I've seen some people that are a lot more blunt than I am in a, in a clinic, but, uh, but, that said, you know, we, we want to be like the bad cop sometimes, you know, yeah. and I think there's a balance, you know, some people get turned off by that. So you don't want to be counterproductive by 
you know, beating them up or anything. But yes, yeah, sometimes you do have to level with people and say, hey, look, you know, this is a wake up call. And, you know, some people just don't like a wake up call. They don't they don't want to hear it. They don't like the truth. Right. They don't. Right. Want, right. They just but, don't want to um, know. But many people do and they appreciate it and they um, say, this is what I needed to hear. And thank you. And that sort of thing. And that's that's what I like to hear. I, I, that's what I want to do you know, for people. So for ideal urinary health, if, if you could take society and get all of us to do a few things to make our urinary health uh, better or its best, what would you recommend we do? Well, um, don't smoke cigarettes. Um, many of our GU malignancies are specifically strongly influenced or you know, your risk for them drastically is worse if you are a smoker, bladder cancer, kidney cancer, um, being definitely two of them. So just don't smoke cigarettes. Um, no, like, no. Does uh, vaping fall into that category too? Any inhalables? So I'm just, I honestly, I, 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 I apologize. I don't have the data on vaping okay. and I'm sure there is some out there, but I do know that it's, I can, I would absolutely not support vaping instead of smoking. Um, it's, I know for a fact that it does awful things to your lungs and I, and you know, we don't even know what's in there. So I would, I would say that it, I mean, I don't have the data in front of me as far as the studies. Um, so I can't, I, I don't want to tell you. That's okay. Absolutely. That's okay. <laughs> but, but I do know that we don't know what we're even putting in there. You know, we know right. like what carcinogens are you even getting from the vape? Um, so yeah, I would, I would not feel, I wouldn't uh, give people a false sense of security that just because they're not smoking a cigarette, that, that it's okay. So vaping, smoking, but I can absolutely tell you that, um, that smoking cigarettes increases your risk for those malignancies. Um, you know, cool it with the coffee a little bit, you know, like, let's just not do like the 18 cups of coffee and then wonder why you're, always going to the bathroom or why you're, it burns when you urinate. And, you know, you know, coffee is a, is a, is great, but it's one of the more acidic things that we eat or drink that we drink. So, you know, if you're, if you're going to the bathroom frequently and urgently and rushing to the bathroom or, um, you know, you got to cool it with the coffee a little bit. Um, and then, you know, of course the artificial sweeteners, all these crazy energy drinks. I mean, they, they're, again, they're a lot of the things that are, um, that are in those, uh, those products are not nice to your bladder. Um, so be smart there, you know, don't let's be, let's be hydrated. But if you're bothered by how frequently you're urinating, you probably don't need to be drinking, you know, 200 ounces of water a day. You know, we don't need to, to carry a Stanley this big to be healthy if you're wetting yourself or if you're you, know, you can't finish a meeting because you're always in the bathroom. So there's a balance there too. Just kind of use a little common sense. Um, but um, what else? Hmm. I mean, get your screening, your prostate cancer screening. Um, and and again, what age is that recommended? So uh, 55 to 69 in a normal male. Um, if you have family history of prostate cancer or you're African American, we we start sooner, 40, 45. Um, is there any sort of uh, and that's just general recommendations. I'm perfect. I'm a little bit, you know, statistics are statistics. There are people that fall out uh, that fall outside of the statistics as well. Okay. So, you know, if you have different symptoms or you have a, even a, you know, kind of a, a hunch or so, or you have that, that tickle in your brain that you might need to, you know, just go see someone. And no, no, we've talked a lot about using the restroom a whole bunch. Is there mm -hmm. harm for people who wait too long to go? People who are just always holding it a little too long. Is there some sort of risk in that? Um, we we find that uh, that teachers and you know are uh, are real. We they call them teacher bladders. Um, so yeah, I mean, urge suppression is good, but um, but suppressing the urge too much. We have some people do end up with detrusor hypocontractility, um, you know, and that's another thing, again, with the, the prostate issues, you know, some men, they're like, oh, well, you know, I get up this many times a night, but it's no big deal. I'm, I'm old now, so it's it's normal or, you know, I've got a weak stream, but it doesn't bother me. Um, some some men will actually end up harming their bladders without knowing it. And so they'll get to a point where 
they finally are miserable enough to come to me and but I look in their bladder and it's just physically completely changed. You've got all this crazy collagen buildup and things that doesn't stretch the way it used to. And so I can't, I can't put it in reverse for them. Okay. Their bladder is always going to be like that. So, so yeah, I mean, don't sit around and, and wait until it's so terrible to, to say, okay, now fix me because your bladder can physically change okay. um, in the, in this time that you're just kind of not doing anything because it's quote, not that bad yet. So be reasonable, be reasonable yeah, with yourself. Yeah. Yeah. This has been absolutely fascinating. And, you know, it's interesting. We talk in the running industry, there's all these, these potty humors. Usually it's number two, number two, number two, and the coffee is the mm. big culprit for that. Right. Yep. But, yeah. but really there's so many people that just need to focus on number one, right? A little bit. Um, and before we go, I do want to say, and again, we're, I'm, this is a little minutia now, but we had talked about medications for overactive bladder earlier. and you know, for those of you who have tried medications and even maybe tried the newer ones, there are, there are even further, you know, line treatments options. We even will, we inject Botox into bladders. That's very effective. Um, there's there, you know, if you've ever heard of those pain stimulators, something so, somewhat similar is used to the, for the nerve to the bladder. That's that dramatically improves, uh, overactivity, urgency, urge incontinence for patients. Um, so anyway, there's things like that out there as well, that, you may not have even heard of that, you know, so don't think, Oh, I've already tried that. So there's, there's no use in trying. And, um, and if someone did try one of these overactive bladder medications, what are the typical side effects that they're going, what do they have to sacrifice in order to get that resolved? I mean, the, the anticholinergic drugs um, are, I mean, I don't prescribe them unless I absolutely have to, because insurance companies will like not approve a drug until it, but those drugs will sometimes um, give you constipation, dry mouth, and if in the elderly, maybe even some confusion. So those are by no means my first go-to, but um, some, many people tolerate those okay, but, but the formulation, most insurance companies are approving this, the beta-3 agonist, this other class of medications um, that, uh, I mean, can I say trade names here? I mean, I'm not. Sure, I don't have I don't have a problem okay. With that. okay. All right. So Merbetric and Jim Tessa are the two um, beta-3 agonists that are on, they're FDA approved in the United States. And the side effect profile for them are, are really good. Um, and with Merbetric, it can sometimes raise your blood pressure. So you just watch that. And if it, if it, if you're one of the people that raises your blood pressure, you just stop it and then go to Jim Tessa. Um, some people, you know, many times will just start Jim Tessa, um, because they don't want to have to deal with that. But, um, I've got many patients that are perfectly happy on Merbetric, don't have any, you know, side effects. Um, you know, they're, again, they're sometimes headache and, but it's those medications, if they work for you and they work the way we want them to, you're really not going to have any side effects. It's just taking a pill once a day. That's great. Um, yeah. Why not? Why not? Right. Well, I just, I would absolutely urge the patients and, you know, I'm going to say women because I think women suffer more than men, um, with all this to not, be brainwashed into thinking that this is just normal. And I, just because all of your friends, I don't care if all of your friends at book club are doing, you know, leaking and wearing pads. That's all of y'all need to come see somebody yeah. because it's not normal. And then you shouldn't live like, you shouldn't feel like you have to live like that. Um, it just, it's, I don't know why, but women have been made to think that they, they need to, you know, that's, that's what they're relegated to. And they're not, I mean, there's a lot of things we can do to help. That's uh, magic. This might be one of the most important podcasts I've ever done because I think there are women who will respond to this and go get help. And and if you're one of those women and you do listen and you do go get help, please let me know. I promise not to share your personal details, but uh, it would really make me happy to know that this impacted you positively. All right, Dr. Collins. Dr. Collins, my running friend. Oh, yeah. I at the end of every show, I recommend a song for people to add to their playlist because a new song okay. can make all the difference in our workouts. So what one song would you ask, would oh, you suggest so people much pressure. add for exercise? It's, 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 yeah. they, they might spend 99 cents at uh, Spotify. So don't feel. Can I do two? Okay. Can I do two songs? Let's go with two. Yes. Because I actually am a, one of those weirdos that like jam bands and most people aren't like, most people probably aren't going to put this on their they radar, might. but That's there great. it's a, it's a band called widespread panic. Um, yes. and there's a song called, and I was thinking of songs that like 
the general audience might really kind of appreciate a little bit more. Um, one is Wondering, okay. Wondering by, by Widespread Panic. And then, um, and as far as the other, um, you know, just kind of like your, you know, again, general public, um, I like, I actually listen to pop, a lot of pop music when I'm running and, or when I'm exercising, just like for the beat and all that kind of stuff. We all do. Um, I mean, and I don't think any of the songs I'm, uh, I mean, I feel like we've all heard of them, but um, so like, you know, we've got Unstoppable and all the Sia, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I don't think that's anything, but um, I like Physical by Dua Lipa. If okay. you haven't heard that, um, I don't know. Can you sing a little be. bit of it? Oh gosh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I want to do that. Uh, Is that a nervous? No, got me. Uh, Let's get physical. How's that? <laughs> that was perfect. I was just, I was just hoping you would. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, Dua Lipa. She's a, um, she's a, she's a national treasure, I guess, for England or something like that. I don't know. I love her. I love her to exercise too. I think she's real upbeat. So oh if you don't know Dua Lipa, check her out. And physical. And physical, physical, yes. Physical. And it's I actually, think, I, I, think I think your um your little singing right there was the best yeah. sales pitch for her song mm -hmm. she could ever ask for right there. Uh, all right. Maybe she'll uh maybe she'll, you know, hear about it and yeah, you know, from fitness. Yeah, I'm and sure say I'm hello sure to me. Listening. So uh are you gonna come back and run the dawn in the next year? Absolutely. 1000%. I love that. That's a great. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, with, because, and we are, we're trying to, you know, help people and we're, the message here is, you know, get help, you know, don't be, don't be crazy. Don't, don't put yourself at risk. But, um, you know, I, I was, it was like, I was close, you know, it was like, I was close to, to not bonking. It was a half, another half mile and I've been all right. So next year, I mean, I, I mean, and, not even next year. I mean, I might do the gate run. I don't know, yeah. but um, is to just not bonk, you know, like the goal is to figure this out. So you don't bonk. Um, right. Cause you know, we, and you know, hydrate and get your electrolytes. And I thought I had it, um, but I, I didn't. So yeah, that's going to be kind of part of my, I mean, it's going to be a very, very uh, big part of all of my preparation for for this year. Well, I am very excited to see you back next year. And I know our uh, finish line uh, experience together oh, will be yeah. much different. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not yeah. going to be gray. <laughs> no, you're going to be pink and your hands I'm are going to be. Need, I'm not going to need medics. It's going to be awesome. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm actually, you know what? I'm so sorry that you, we had a scary moment with you, but I'm glad it led to this because yeah, I too. really me think too. a lot of people Absolutely. are going to have their lives changed from your quality advice. Dr. Collins, thank so. you so much for being on thank the Fitzgerald Show. Yeah, thank you so much. Of course, folks, if you so haven't done so. so already, make sure you click like on the podcast, share with a friend, and please leave a review. I really like it when you do. And um, again, reach out and let me know uh, what you think about this episode. And if you have more questions, I'll send them Dr. Collins way. All right, Dr. Collins, you have to say three things to my listeners. You just have to say, get to work. Get to work. Hi, this is Rudy Novotny, the voice of America's marathons. We all love how much running has benefited every aspect of our lives, so much so that most of us only wish we'd started sooner. Wouldn't it be wonderful to give the opportunity to children of today? Well, you can. The Morning Mile is a before-school walking and running program that gives children the chance to start each day in an active way while enjoying fun, music, and friends. That's every child, every day. It's also supported by a wonderful system of rewards, which keeps students highly motivated and frequently congratulated. Created by our favorite fitness expert, Fitz Kohler, Morning Milers across the country have run over 2 million miles and are having greater success with academics, behavior, and sports because of it. The Morning Mile is free to the child, free to the school, and is inexpensively funded by businesses or generous individuals. Help more kids get moving in the morning by visiting MorningMile.com. Champion the program at your favorite school or find out more about sponsorship opportunities. That's MorningMile.com. Long may you run.